Now we're on page 20, up to the very end of the Cyclops. Where we left off was that Polyphemus was crying out for help, and we begin. Some heard him, and they came by diverse ways to clump around outside and call, What ails you, Polyphemus? Why do you cry so sore in the starry night? You will not let us sleep. Sure, no man's driving off your flock. No man has tricked you, ruined you. And out of the cave, the mammoth Polyphemus roared an answer, Nobody! Nobody's tricked me! Nobody's ruined me! And to this rough shout, they made a sage reply, Ah, well, if nobody has played you foul there in your lonely bed, we are no use in pain given by great Zeus. Let it be your father, Poseidon Lord, to whom you pray. And so saying, they trailed away. And I was filled with laughter to see how, like a charm, the name had deceived them. Now Cyclops, wheezing as the pain came on him, fumbled to wrench away the great doorstone. And then he squatted in the breach with arms thrown wide for any silly beast or man who bolted. Remember, he's completely blind, so he's just going to have to feel for anybody that tries to run through the open door. Hoping somehow I might be such a fool. But I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there huge. How could we slip away? I drew on all my wits and I ran through tactics, reasoning as a man will for dear life. Until a trick came and it pleased me well. The Cyclops' rams, remember them? They were handsome and fat with heavy fleeces, a dark violet, so like really dark black. Three abreast, I tied them silently together, twining cords of willow from the ogre's bed, and then slung a man under the middle of each one to ride there safely, shielded left and right. Now, normally when I teach this, I will draw it up on the board, but I want you to imagine there's a sheep on the left, a sheep on the right, and a sheep in the middle, and they're tied together. And then what Odysseus has done is he's tied somebody to be underneath the three sheep and when they go walking through the doorway, the three sheep, they'll be able to sneak their way through, right? So it says, so three sheep could convey each man. And I took the wooliest ram, I, the choicest of the flock. And I hung myself under his kinky belly. That means it's all curly. And I pulled up tight with fingers twisted deep in the sheepskin ringlets for an iron grip. So breathing hard, we waited until morning so we were going to just wait him out when dawn spread out her fingertips of rose remember this personification the rams began to stir moving for pasture so polyphemus is going to hear this because he's blind and he's going to know that his sheeps need to get out and eat they're hungry and go to the bathroom and peals of bleeding echoed around the pens like <laughs> where dams with udders full called for milking blinded and sick with pain from his head wound the master stroked each ram and then he let it pass through the doorway but my men riding on the pectoral that means the chest fleece the giant's blind hands blundering never found so they go through the doorway and when polyphemus feels the ram he can't feel the men underneath, right? Last of all, last of them all, my ram, the leader came, weighted by wool and me with my meditation. So I'm thinking things through. The Cyclops patted him and then he said to my ram, sweet cousin ram, why lag behind the rest in the night cave? You never linger so, but graze before them all and go afar to crop sweet grass and take your stately way, leading along the streams until evening. You run to be the first one in the fold. But why now, now so far behind? Can you be grieving over your master's eye? That carrion rogue and his accursed companions burnt it out when he conquered all my wits with wine. Nobody will get out of this alive, I swear. Oh, had you brain and voice to tell where he may be now dodging all my fury? Bashed by this hand and bashed on this rock wall, his brains would strew the floor and I should have rest from the outrage nobody worked upon me. Now, guys, 
this is a bit of irony, right? Dramatic irony, because we all know that he's talking to the ram. The ram, of course, can't say anything, but the ram is carrying the burden of Odysseus's body. And it's very, that's a very funny section. He sent us out into the open and then close by, I dropped. So I came, I went out from underneath my ram and I rolled clear of the ram's belly going this way and that to you untie my men with many glances back we rounded up his fat stiff-legged sheep to take aboard so we're going to steal them and drove them down to where the good ship lay we saw as we came near our fellows faces shining and then we saw them turn to grief tallying or counting those who had not fled from death i hushed them shh, and jerking head and eyebrows up and in a low voice i told them load this herd move fast and put the ship's head toward the breakers so out toward where the surf is so they all pitched in at lo at loading and then embarked and struck their oars into the sea so they sit at their benches right and they're oaring and they're oaring far out so they are really pushing their way out as far as they can as far offshore as I was able to call out and my words still be able to be heard, I sent back a few words to my adversary and I yelled, Oh, Cyclops, would you feast on my companions? Puny am I in a caveman's hands? How would you like the beat? How did you like the beating that we gave you, you damned cannibal, eater of guests under your roof? Zeus and the gods have paid you. The blind thing, in his doubled fury, he broke a whole hilltop off in his hand, and he heaved it at us. Ahead of our black prow, it struck, because the ship is heading out to sea, so he didn't quite get the ship. It falls just ahead of the ship. Ahead of our black prow, it struck, and it sank, overwhelmed in a, spush, a spuming geyser, a giant wave that washed the ship's stern foremost back to shore the wave is so powerful from the mountaintop i got the longest boat hook out and i stood fending us off with furious nods to all to put their backs into a racing stroke row row or perish so as the long oars bent kicking the foam sternward making head until we drew away and twice as far now when i cupped my hands i heard the crew in their low voices protesting they're like no don't do it don't do it because odysseus is about to yell now folks this is where we find out that odysseus is sometimes his anger gets the best of him and he's full of pride right now that word is hubris remember that one from our notes so the but the men are saying god's sake captain why bait the beast again let him alone that tidal wave he made on the first throw all but beached us it all but stove us in giving him our bearing with your trumpeting he'll range and lob a boulder so you keep yelling he's going to be able to hear where we are and the next time when he throws a piece of a mountain at us it's going to get us and someone else yells, I, he'll smash our timbers and our heads together. I would not heed them, though, in my glorying spirit. But I let my anger flare and I yelled, Cyclops, if ever mortal man inquire or ask how you were put to shame and blinded, then you tell him, Odysseus, raider of the cities, took your eye, Laertes' son, whose home's on Ithaca. Folks, this is such a dumb mistake. This is like a robber leaving his driver's license on the counter of the bank and saying, here I am. My name is Joe Smith. I live at 1234 Springbrook Lane, right? Because now Polyphemus knows exactly who this guy is. He knows his name really isn't nobody. And he knows who his dad is, Laertes, and he even knows where he lives on Ithaca. And at this, Polyphemus is so mad and he gave a mighty sob and he rumbled, ah, now comes the weird upon me, like this very strange thing, spoken of old, a wizard, grand and wondrous, lived here, Telemus, a son of Uramus, great length of days he had in wizardry among the Cyclops. And in these things, he foretold for time to come that my great eye would be lost and at Odysseus's hands. Always in my mind, I had had some giant that was armed. Here is Polyphemus throwing, throwing the boulder. I had in my mind some giant that was in great force and he would come 
here against me. But this, but you, you small, pitiful, twiggy thing, you put me down with wine and you blinded me. Come back, Odysseus, and I'll treat you well, praying for the god of earthquake to befriend you. That would be Poseidon. For his son am I, and for he by his avowal fathered me, and if he will, he may heal me of this black wound. He and no other of all the happy gods are mortal men. Now, I don't know about you, but if this big guy were screaming for me to come back and promising me that he would treat me well, um, I'm not so sure I would believe him. We don't know here if, if Polyphemus is being serious or what, but... Odysseus isn't buying it. He says, few words I shouted in reply to him. If I could take your life, I would. And I would take your time away and hurl you down to hell. The God of earthquake could not heal you there. So in other words, your dad's not going to help you down there. And at this, he stretched his hands out into the darkness. And guys, this is really where the odyssey, the 10 years of turmoil begins right here at this curse. Polyphemus reaches his hands up to the gods and he says, they're toward the skies, toward the stars. Oh, hear me, Lord, blue girdler of the islands. A girdle kind of stretches around, right? It's the ocean. If I am thine indeed, and thou art father, Grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, never see his home. Laertes' son, I mean, who kept his hall on Ithaca. Should destiny intend that he shall see his roof again among his family in his fatherland? Far be that day and dark the years between. Let him lose all of his companions and return under a strange sail to bitter days at home. This, folks, is the curse. All of these words right here are the curse of Polyphemus, and he's begging his father Poseidon to do this against Odysseus. And in these words he prayed, and the god heard him. Now he laid his hands upon a bigger stone, and he wheeled around Titanic for the cast. You know how you're casting a fishing line? He's kind of taking this huge mountainous rock, and he let it fly in the black proud vessel's track but it fell short just aft of the steering oar and whelming the seas, it rose giant above the stone to bear us onward toward the island. So now they're actually being forced back to the island. And there, as we ran in, we saw the squadron waiting, the trim ships drawn up side by side and all our troubled friends who waited looking seaward. We beached her grinding keel in the soft sand and we waded in ourselves on the sandy beach. Then. We unloaded all of the Cyclops flock to make division, share and share alike. Everybody gets a sheep. Only my fighters voted that my ram, the prize of all, should go to me. And I slew him, so he slaughters him, by the seaside. And I burnt his long thigh bones to Zeus beyond the storm cloud. So this is his offering. But will Zeus listen? Kronos' son who rules the world, but Zeus disdained my offering. Destruction for my ships he had in sh store, and death for those who sailed them, my companions. Now, all day long, until the sun went down, we made our feast on mutton and sweet wine, till after sunset in the gathering dark, we went to sleep above the wash of ripples. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose touched the world, I roused my men and gave orders to man the ships, casting off the mooring lines and filing in to sit beside the rowlocks. The oarsmen in line dipped their oars into the gray sea. And so we moved out, sad in the vast offing, having our precious lives, but not our friends. So folks, that ends the Odyssey part one, the Cyclops. And we all now understand that this part is infamous because the Cyclops has cursed Odysseus that he should never see his homeland. And that if it is fate that he does see his homeland, then let that day be far into the future. Let him lose all of his companions. Let him come home under a dark sail. Now, 
let's review one little section before we end the Cyclops to help you with your questions. This is a question about fate. So he mentions fate here when he's making his prayer that if it is destiny for Odysseus to return home, but there was another section where it mentions the destiny. Here is Polyphemus getting ready to throw the mountaintop. And in the background, you can probably see these other brutes. They are behind the mountains. But at this point right here in our PDF, Polyphemus is, is having this moment where he realizes, oh my goodness, wait a minute, I remember this. A long time ago, there was a prophecy that somebody named Odysseus was going to harm me. I was going to lose my eye. And all these years, I was thinking that it was going to be some other giant like me that was going to come and attack me and hurt me. But here you are, you twiggy, small, pitiful thing. So fate plays a very important role in the Odyssey. And we will find out how that plays its next part when we read about the land of the dead 